The Purple Line is a community podcast, bringing you in-depth conversations with diverse leaders in the public and private sectors. Whether you're a student looking to gather advice or a professional tuning in for valuable resources, our dynamic programming provides tips for all ages and backgrounds. I'm your host, Keith Fernandez, and this is The Purple Line. On today's episode, I'm sitting down with Janelle Perez, candidate for the Florida State Senate. Janelle is a mother, small business owner, and cancer survivor at the forefront of the fight for equality. Born and raised in Miami, Janelle saw her parents become successful entrepreneurs after fleeing Castro's dictatorship. Now, she's running for the Florida State Senate to fight for opportunities for every child and family. Her personal experience battling illness and professional experience as an advocate and business owner has deepened her commitment to ensuring every Floridian has access to affordable, high-quality health care. A graduate of Florida International University, FIU, and the Johns Hopkins University, Janelle currently lives in Pinecrest, a sub of Miami with her wife and two daughters. Welcome to the Purple Line, Janelle Perez. My friend, I've known you for, I don't know, more years than we can count. We, you were very young when we met. So, you know, we've known yes. you for the 10 plus years. Um, thank you for, for joining us today. The first Chile alumnus to be on this podcast since it's relaunch. So we're so excited. We're honored that you're here. Um, and you're following a, a line of strong Latinas. Marianne was the first one, then Ileana ross Layton and our old boss, and now you. So super excited, uh, oh super thrilled to be talking you um love the background i mean i need something that coordinated so come on it's marketing when you're a candidate you have to market yourself really it's, well it's twitter facebook instagram yeah. de todo. i want any time from now until november and beyond that i mean we you and i learned from the best yeah Eliana had yellow and brown i know from the 80s all the way to the end when she decided she was no longer running so Everyone, I want to recognize these colors as this is me. Anytime you see these blues and green, you're going to think of me. I love it. I love it. I love it. And uh, and, and I wanted to, to start folks off. Uh, many folks don't know your story. You're currently running for state Senate in Florida. Um, you know, just a few short months away is election day. Um, but before that, um, you're Miami native. You're a small business owner. You're a wife. You're a graduate of Florida International University. I think that so many of us have this uh, conception, you know, when we're younger. I mean, back when you were a Chile intern, even before then, like, you obviously are passionate about public service today, but one of the things that I don't think a lot of folks um, hear from successful people is how they got started. And so can you just tell us a little bit about um, your origin story, basically? Like, you know, you're from Miami, but why did public service attract you? And then why did interning for Chile first attract you? Yeah, so my, I, I always knew that I was interested in, in politics. I remember, um, I remember being as, I, I think it was like fourth grade, I remember debating, it was the election of Bob Dole versus Bill Clinton. And I remember we had a professor in fourth grade or a teacher. Um, I, I went to Devon Air Elementary who asked us to do like a mock debate kind of thing. Um, and I mean, as good as you can in fourth grade. Yeah. Um, and I remember being very passionate about it and feeling very passionate about it. And then I went to Lourdes Academy later on in life and in high school, I did close up got to meet Congresswoman Ross Layton and got to see Washington, D.C. And I knew that it was always something I was very, very interested in. I still had not thought that it would be a career. Um, but then it was while I was at FIU, I had a professor that had asked me, what do you want to do in life? And, and I said, well, I want to be, I don't know, I want to run for something maybe, yeah. or I want to, um, I don't know. There was just, there was a lot of things. And he goes, well, why don't you go intern for Ileana Ross Layton? And so I did, I, I ended up reaching out to them. Um, and my family business at the time was healthcare and it's gonna go back to that because it's a big part of my story. Yeah. Um, but I went to Washington DC, started interning for Eliana. And um, I don't know if, I mean, you know this, but to get Eliana's attention, um, I started making her Cuban coffee. Like I learned to make the, the best Cuban coffee in the office. And I would wait until she would get in first thing in the morning and I find out what time she was going to get to the office and I'd make sure that her Cuban coffee was ready. And that's how her and I started talking was she would spend some time actually getting to know me and and realizing what my interests were asking me about myself. Um, and then, you know, the rest is history. I stayed working for her um, on the camp on her campaign in 2010 um, and then on the Committee on Foreign Affairs when she became the chairwoman. Um, 
And, you know, I still had not thought, I knew it was always something I wanted to do later on in life, but um, life is, life tends to throw curveballs at you. Yeah. So I started working for the Global Fund after I left the Hill while, while I was getting my master's degree. It was a lot easier working for a nonprofit than the hustle and bustle of, of Capitol Hill um, while doing your master's degree. Um, and it was right afterwards that I had gotten diagnosed with cancer. I moved back home. I spent um, spent like about two years that my career, what I thought was always going to be in politics, came, be, came on hold. And I kind of thought that it was over for me. Like any, whatever political track or whatever it was that I wanted to do in politics was going to change. Um, I had just during, actually, I'm sorry, I, I should go back to the chili part. It was during uh, a little bit. Right before I went and worked on her campaign, I, that's when I was the Chile Fellow. And it was an incredible experience. I got to do it under, uh, she was ranking member at the time under Congresswoman Rossane. And so it was a great experience. I got to continue work interning with her longer because it was unpaid. Uh, both of them were unpaid, but Chile definitely helped me stay longer as an unpaid <laughs> intern. Um, but sorry, so when I when I got diagnosed, I moved back here, started working again in our family business, which was healthcare. Um, and I remember thinking, okay, one day I'm gonna run, but that day isn't now. I have to, I always felt like, and maybe this is something being a woman, being openly gay, um, being from Miami, that I thought I needed to do like I needed to do something real with my career in order to be qualified enough to run for office. So I was like, maybe I need to open a business or I need to do something crazy. All of these people who run usually do something crazy with their life. Um, and it wasn't until, when, when was like that moment? I think I sat down with my wife and we were watching something uh, like some testimony happening on, on the Hill in the Senate. And I remember seeing just a bunch of old white men on the dais and it was a Senate hearing and thinking, man, there's no one up there that looks anything like me that knows anything about what it is to be Hispanic in America or a woman or openly gay or anything like that. And these are the people making the decisions. And I kind of, I started, my wheels started turning and Monica and I, my wife started having, you know, Monica started having the conversation. Um, and I think that's when it started. And, and, you know, now I'm a year into campaigning. I am the Democratic nominee, uh, like not nominee, but the, the Democratic ca candidate yeah. for State Senate District 38 in Florida. Um, I've done everything possible to avoid a primary. So I, that's it. This is it. And, and when this comes out, which will be June 30th, I want to say you're close there, um, you will already know if you have a primary by then or not. This, is, this one we're recording is qualifying week, right? Actually, today I qualified. I got the official, That's, oh, wow. the official text message that I qualified. And then qualification ends June 16th. So I have uh, just a few more days to go. But I, you know, oh my gosh. not heard of anything. And Good. I'm going to have a linebacker like at the door <laughs> oh no um at the door of of the the florida elections no i'm just kidding but no no but uh, i mean happy qualifying week to all who celebrate right it's, yeah uh, right it, oh my god it's a nail biter when i worked for leona it was always a nail biter just to the end so right so it's, let, i'm lighting a chili candle for you right now <laughs> yeah yeah there's a bunch of us celebrating on uh through like we're in a big chat everybody is celebrating like i just qualified it's official um so yes, fingers crossed for two, it. what is it? Today's the 13th. So it's three more days, fingers crossed that there's no one else that jumps in into the Democrat. I've not heard of anything. I've, I've really built a big war chest and I've got a, a huge amount of support behind my, my candidacy. So I'm, I'm pretty confident that this is it. Absolutely. And I think you, uh, you've hit a milestone anyway, because you're the first Chile alumnus to, uh, qualify for office in Miami. So, uh, okay. you know, you, you, it's not that highest one under your belt, but it's a pretty good designation. Yeah, um, awesome. Yeah, yeah right. Um, you know, I know 
a lot of folks um, take the leap figuratively, figuratively when they run for office. But I think one of the leaps that was taken for you in life was your cancer diagnosis. And it's something that's a big part of your story and that you touch on. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that and like just how it upended your life and what lessons you learned about being brave and about being your authentic self um, yeah. from a situation that I don't think anyone in their 20s, which, you know, at the time is when you were diagnosed with cancer and pretty severe cancer, um, sort of forced you to confront all at once. So for me, um, you know, I was, I was 28 years old when I got diagnosed. I had just finished my master's at Hopkins and I had been recruited by IE in Madrid to do their international MBA program. And I will never forget it. My flight was scheduled to move to Madrid April 15th. And on April 13th was the day that the doctor called me in and told me that I had cancer. I had not been fully diagnosed um, for, for until a month later, but I ended up having stage four follicular lymphoma and large B cell lymphoma. And the follicular lymphoma is supposed to be incurable, but again, here I am seven yeah. years later and I'm cancer free. Um, it was very hard, but um, that same day that I got diagnosed, I came out to my mom and dad and told them that I was gay. They did not know that I was gay. Um, I had this whole life that planned, like it was, it was, it was crazy. There was, there was so many things that I wanted to do. I was going to move to Spain, which was my dream. Um, my then girlfriend, Monica was going to come and um, and, and spend some time with me over there. We were going to travel. We were going to enjoy it. And then I even remember the day that I got diagnosed when they told me like, you have cancer. I'm like, well, my flights, I know it's Thursday, my flights on Sunday. So should I postpone it? Or like, what do you think? And the doctor's like, yeah, you, you definitely should postpone it. Um, and I'm like, no, but like the flight. So you think like what a month? Like I'm gonna be yeah, like, like like next week like it'll yeah. be okay yeah, yeah it's, no well, I I feel like that was maybe like the shock <laughs> of such big news and you're trying to comprehend and you're like in yeah. the roundabout way of asking how severe is this is like the flight and like well if he lets me go in a week it's not that bad but if he doesn't yeah and it's funny I I had I they were I that same day she was like okay we're gonna draw some blood I'm gonna get you in with the yeah. surgeon. Um, cause they still didn't know how severe, how bad it was. Um, she, I think she knew cause she's like, all of your lymph nodes are enlarged and you have a tumor and like all of this stuff. And she's like, and it's all over your body, but I'm just like, what's lymphoma. And looking at my dad who was next to me and he was crying and, and I'm like, why are you crying? Like, I, give me the pill and I'm going to be fine. Like, and, my, and I'm going to go live in, in Spain and everything's going to be fine. And I remember telling as they were drawing my blood and they didn't know anything, I remember looking, and this is a very Miami thing of me to do, but I remember looking at the phlebotomist and saying, okay, so I just, I just got my hair done and I got it the color that I really wanted it to be. Is it going to fall off? And she's like, <laughs> I don't know. There's some treatment. It was, it's like, it didn't all hit me and registered. Yeah. Um, and it, it really did up in my life, but it put so much into perspective for me. Yeah. Um, I was always so worried about what was my next step going to be. Um, and I think a lot of people in their twenties are always worried about where am I going to go next? And I meant career wise. Yeah. Personally, I was not thinking about any step. I was like, I'm never getting married. I'm never having kids. I'm focused on my career. Um, and it really, it changed all of that for me. Um, I was deathly afraid of coming out to my mom and dad. Yeah. Um, it was really hard for my extremely conservative family um, for me to tell them. And when I finally told them and they were, it was a little bit hard at first, but I think when they saw the way that Monica loves me yeah. and the way that I love her yeah. and how I honestly believe that a big part of my fight and the reason why I fought and what drove me to fight was that I wanted a life with her. Yeah. Um, and, and realizing how much I wanted to have kids. I wanted to be around my family. I wanted to, it almost, it reprioritized everything for me and family first, yeah. first and foremost, which is why a big part of now running, I would not be able to do this without my family 
you know, Monica, if Monica wasn't on board with this, I would not be able to do this. And if my mom and dad weren't on board with this, I wouldn't be able to do this. Um, because now I have two kids. And literally, when we started this interview, my, my mom is sitting in my living room with the baby. Monica was picking the our, 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 our older one up from 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 camp. So it's like, it's it takes it takes a village. And um, I wouldn't be able to accomplish the things that I've accomplished in my career if I didn't get this new perspective and and I needed it and it was a big wake-up call for me about what, how much I wanted to be alive. Absolutely and, and what do you think that whole experience taught you about perseverance? I mean I think that professionally and personally I mean you've you've had to persevere. Um, how did it give you the perspective that you now take into running for office or running your small business or even you know the perseverance of being a parent like some things are great on instagram but then you like turn instagram off and you're like okay i gotta feed the kids like yeah so, yeah um i think it makes you i think at least for me what it did was yeah. when it made me realize just how strong i can be um it made me realize um how bad i how bad I want, like how bad I want to live. Yeah. Like I want, I want to be alive. I want to enjoy life. And then when it, when it, what it kind of did with the perseverance thing is that it kind of made me realize that I need to take risks in life. Nothing that I do is going to be worse than cancer. Um, career wise and, and business wise, wise, you know, I, had a huge shift in my career. I was always involved in politics. I studied political science. And then I started a, a, a healthcare, a Medicare HMO with my family, which is totally different from anything I ever did. It's an actual business and running a company where we have around 200 employees providing services to 13,000 people in Miami-Dade County. And now we just expanded into Broward. That is so far from what I had ever done, um, but it's about taking risks. Yeah. And, and cancer showed me that there's nothing, there's nothing that can hold you back but yourself. Um, and you just, it's easier said than done, but try really hard not to be afraid. And if you're afraid, do it even more. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And I think that one of the things too, um, you had that really, really unfortunate experience of cancer. Um, but I think being the owner of a healthcare company, one thing I'm always curious about is how did that help inform your perspective as the owner of a healthcare company? I mean, you've been at really one of the worst stages of a disease. Um, you obviously, many of your clients are patients and I hope none of them have cancer, but you know, statistically probably, yeah, some do. And how does that inform your approach to your business and being a business owner that is responsive and responsible to their clients? So we are in a, we are in Miami-Dade County is, you know, we have a lot of issues here when it comes yeah. to providing healthcare services. There's, there's a lot of problems. Um, our business is something that we are incredibly proud of because in Miami-Dade County, um, and this goes to the, the treatment that I felt when I was going into for my cancer treatment and how I wanted to be treated. We make sure that that is implemented in our business. We're the only Medicare HMO company and that's providing services to people 65 and over. We're the only one that's 100% owned and operated here in Miami-Dade County. It is extremely important to us that we only hire from within Miami-Dade County and that when you call our customer service, if you are a member, healthcare is scary. If you are a member and you are calling customer service for, for something that deals with your health insurance, Things are already going wrong. You are already frustrated. You are already confused. I want to make sure that you're talking to somebody in Coral Gables who's going to be able to solve that problem for you quickly. So we do everything in-house. Um, customer service, medical management, everything, claims, all of that kind of stuff is done in-house so that we can turn things around quickly. And you're talking to somebody who, when it's raining outside, knows it's raining outside in your neighborhood too. Like... When, 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 the, when the streets are flooded in your neighborhood and you can't get to the doctor's office, you're talking to somebody who can say, yeah, I know I had a hard time at work. That kind of familiarity yeah. in this community is so important. Um, and that's what I wanted with my healthcare. So that's something that we've, I'm definitely really proud of. Um, and 
that's something that I know I'm going to take with me to the state legislature when I'm providing my constituent services. I also learn from one of the best. Um, so it's really, you know, this is a this is a community that needs familiarity. This is a yeah. community that um, that doesn't want to be talking to someone in Indiana or in India. This is a community that wants to be talking to somebody right here, um, and that's really important. And and when it came to my healthcare, I mean, I would go in for my chemo treatments at seven in the morning, and when I'd come out five hours later, the people that were in the waiting room at seven a.m. were still in the waiting room at two p.m. when I'd be done. And I still consider those as the lucky people. Those people had the opportunity to take the day off of work to go get their treatment. They had access to a doctor to even get diagnosed in the first place. But in Florida, there's way too many people that don't have that kind of access or support. Um, and that kind of drove me into wanting to run and wanting to run now. Now I've experienced enough where I can say, we need to change things. And I mean, my, if you've seen my platform, my biggest, mm -hmm. my biggest, biggest fight is healthcare. And that's a great segue too, especially the familiarity and the advocacy. Um, you're a first time candidate um, with, you know, you've never run for office before. Your family is political with a small p, but you know, certainly nobody was in elected office to my knowledge. Um, and I think that one of the things that's always really impressive um, about you to me is that you are taking those risks and you're um, taking that advocacy that you've honed your entire life, either you know, working in Congress, working in the nonprofit sector as a small business owner um, and applying those lessons to your campaign platform. So um, would love to hear a little bit more about what your sort of campaign philosophy is in wanting to represent South Florida and like what we, the business lens that you'll be taking um, to Tallahassee and you know, certainly the, the voters will um, hear more about it, but wanted to see if uh, some Chile alumni could hear a little bit about it too. So I, when it comes to like the, the business part of my life and, and just how I've been, how I've been raised is, and, and, you know, going up to Tallahassee, I'm a very different kind. I am running as a Democrat, but I'm a very different kind of Democrat. Um, and, and I think in Florida, we are seeing more Democrats step up that are extremely pro-business and understanding Florida and, and especially the Miami-Dade County, um, you know, demographics and just ideology. We are an extremely socially progressive city, pretty much. We are, we are, we are pretty progressive when it comes to social issues, but no one here wants to pay more taxes. I don't want to pay more taxes. Um, nobody, you know, uh, we are all, I mean, at least me, I'm a Cuban exile. You know, those, those, yeah. that, those scare tactics that get used in the past, they don't stick with me yeah. um, when it comes to, to the attacks that we have seen coming from, I'm, from, from the Florida GOP uh, or, or the Miami-Dade GOP here. Um, those, those attacks, can't, they won't stick with me because of the business experience that I have and just the things that I stand for. Um, I believe that Everyone deserves access to affordable, high quality healthcare. Everyone deserves access to affordable education. Um, and we can do that. And I really strongly believe that through competition, we are gonna drive um, the cost of things down and the services, the quality are gonna be incredibly high. We just need our government to catch up with that. Um, and in Florida, we haven't seen that in, in 25 years. We have seen a very, it feels like our government right now in Florida, and I'm, I'm not talking about anything federal, but in Florida, it has felt like it has been very, very pro-business without thinking about what is going to happen to our constituency. We have around 800,000 people that would qualify for access to Medicaid if we just went up to Obamacare standards or Affordable Care Act standards here in Florida. Um, we have the highest enrollees in, in the Affordable Care Act in Miami-Dade County than we have anywhere else in the country. And so the need is here. Yeah. Um, but our legislature has consistently avoided doing anything about that or avoided catching up to that for whatever political reason or not. 
Um, but I think when folks, when you start talking to folks in this community, and I've been going out there and I've been talking to folks and I remind them that we're all paying for Medicaid in our federal tax dollars. The state keeps rejecting that money when it's supposed to come back down. Um, there's an additional $2,000 tax for anyone who goes to the hospital and has insurance in the state of Florida to cover the uninsured. Um, we're paying for it. Yeah. We are paying for it. One way or another, we're paying for it. Expanding um, access is not is not going to change the burden, the cost burden to the to to the taxpayers here in Florida. Um, that's that's something that that you know my experience and and what I what is a critical to my my platform. Um, another thing, I mean, Miami Dade County has become incredibly unaffordable. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure you've you've heard of that. You're from here. Yeah. Um, it is people can't afford to live here anymore. My friends are moving back in with their parents. My friends are holding off on having kids. Um, it's, it's become unaffordable for so many people. Um, and our legislature isn't doing anything to address that. Um, so it's, there's, there's a lot of issues that we've yeah, been yeah. facing um, on affordability. I mean, we had a tropical storm not that long ago and I think Cutler Bay is still underwater. Um, Sorry, I think <laughs> Color Bay. I'm sorry, my mom is leaving. <laughs> Her baby's duties are over. Um, Color Bay is still underwater from a tropical storm that happened two weeks ago. Yeah. Um, there's, there's, we've got problems down here that need to be addressed, and 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 they need to be addressed by somebody who's willing to have the difficult conversations and has nothing else to lose. Like, this is this is not for political gains for me. This is because I genuinely care about this community. You, and you know what strikes me about the passion um, that you bring to your campaign platform is Chile alumni generally are able to reach across the aisle and understand different perspectives and embrace that. And I know that we're running up a little bit on time, but I wanted to ask, what did being a Chile intern and working in Congress through Chile and um, really having that experience in DC um, teach you about reaching across the aisle to um, get results, which, you know, it sounds like there are a lot of results to be gotten. Um, yeah. And yeah, I mean, I think for anyone listening who wants to apply to the program, who wants to be part of the program, um, what lessons did it teach you um, and how are you implementing them today? Um, I think that Chile, Chile definitely helped me um, meet more folks. It was funny, I was a Republican when I was a Chile fellow. Um, and I definitely got to work with a lot of Democrats while, while I was in Chile. Um, I made a lot of friends that are Democrats and, and friends today. Um, and, and it really, it helped me have those conversations. And, and when you're having conversations with people that you are interning or your fellows with, you're seeing a perspective that you might not have seen before. Um, you're forced to have conversations and be friends with these people that you might not be because you don't hang around in the same circles. Um, so it definitely opened me up to that. I was also a Chile fellow in a time when it felt like Congress was willing to work together um, a lot more. I also was working for a member of Congress who definitely reached across the aisle a lot to get things done for her community. Um, and so it, it definitely taught me a lot about bipartisanship. Um, I think Chile is an incredible organization. I've also not just been a Chile fellow who has learned a lot, but I've also been a, a supporter of Chile. My family has, yeah. has been supporters um, for, for a while, or actually, I think last year. Yeah. We were. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, in, it's incredible. It's, it's, it's amazing. I love the, the fact that we are uplifting Hispanic voices um, which is very important. And, and, and I love that it's extremely bipartisan. I, you know, I remember thinking at one point, like this is the Republican version of, of CHCI or something like that. And, and, and you know what, it's not, it's everybody. I was actually in my class of fellows. I was the only Republican. Um, it is truly bipartisan. Um, and, and it has been, it was an incredible experience for me. It helped me in a time when I could know, I, I only could afford to be a, a, an unpaid intern for one semester. And it helped me be an unpaid intern on the Committee on Foreign Affairs for a whole other semester. And 
look at that's what actually sparked my career in foreign affairs at the beginning. So um, it's 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 incredible, and and just the relationships that I that I have um, from Chile have been amazing. I I love it. Uh, la last question for you: uh, You and your beautiful wife Monica have two kids. Um, so my question is: Are they both applying to be Chile interns? Is it going to be one or the other? I mean, you know, they got a little while, but what do you think? We'll see. I don't know. My my five year old is. Um, Tiene chispa. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. We'll see. All right. Um, I mean, I have been, I have been like instilling in her brain since birth. You want to go to college in DC. You want to go to college Good. in DC. So um, yes, absolutely. Um, hopefully they will. Um, in whatever, who knows? Chile, Chile keeps growing. I know. So many different kinds of programs. Who knows if they don't love pro uh, uh, um uh, politics at the time, but Chile is yeah. actually expanding with business programs, right? Yeah, they're expanding. They had a law fellowship. They've got a lot going on. Yeah. Um, so go. hopefully we'll have a lot for them to apply to. So that yeah. is, that is awesome. Janelle, an alumna who makes us proud. We cannot wait to see your success. Um, and tell folks what website do they go to if they want to learn more about your campaign? Oh, wow. Well, look at that, right? I, up here. But if they're listening, yeah. We've got, uh, so the website is www.janelleperez.com. Uh, and then my social media is at Janelle Sophia. Um, and Sophia is spelled the Cuban way with an F, not <laughs> the love it. I love it. I love it. Follow her on Twitter. Go to her campaign website, a Chile alumna who makes us proud every day. We cannot wait to see uh, what happens in the future. Thank you so much for joining us and walking on the Purple Line. Of course. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Purple Line. You can follow me at underscore Keith Fernandez on Twitter and make sure to follow Chile across all social media platforms at the Chile for the latest updates.